some of the discussion around that second point. Uh, and certainly, you know, as it relates to GDPR and who is and the ongoing policy work in the EPDP and ICANN, um, obviously a, a topic of great interest for all of us and particularly uh, those who have relied upon uh, the WHOIS database for any range of, uh, of, of perfectly legitimate reasons uh, is a serious concern and I'm sure that uh, they'll want to talk about that as well. I expect the response to questions about who is, what comes next, the EPDP, GDPR impact will be, uh, it's with the community right now in this EPDP, this ex expedited policy development process, and that the ICANN board will take the recommendations from the community on what to do next. Uh, but it's certainly a perfectly uh, you know, reasonable thing to discuss with the board. And Yaron, thank you. Thanks, Keith. Um, so moving on, we've got, I see we have only five minutes on the clock for this. Um, also tomorrow, um, starting at two o'clock, <coughs> from two to three, we're meeting with the representatives of the African Union, um, and we are looking for a, for a co-chair for that meeting. Um, so if I can call on um, either of you to, to support um, Diego in the meeting um, with the African Union, a volunteer. I'm happy to do it. What time is it again? From two to three. All right. Thank you, Cheryl. Um, so we're also hoping to discuss with them their priorities um, uh, for the internet governance space, um, their um, expectations from IGF, and also it would be good um, to see them, what their reaction is to the output-oriented uh, question uh, and what we've been discussing. Um, so with um, Africa on our minds, um, I know uh, Disney is preparing a really nice event uh, tomorrow evening, um, showcasing a, a, a movie. Um, coming from that region, um, like the Ni Nigerian director, um, who will also be there to um, answer some of your questions. So just to break up this boring meeting uh, and think of something fun, um, please join uh, all of us at 6.30 tomorrow um, in the evening. And cocktails, absolutely, that's very important. Uh, and then moving on to uh, Wednesday, um, in the morning at 10 o'clock, we are meeting um, the government of Germany. Um, the meeting will be chaired by Thomas um, and, uh, and by, Die uh, and by uh, Elizabeth, sorry, because we will be leaving here though by Wednesday. Um, and of course, you can imagine Germany, we're looking to see what, they're, uh, what they have in store for IGF 2019. Um, I think we haven't had a, an organization for an IGF that started so early. I think the Germans are further along with the organization as than the French are right now <laughs> for this one. They, they, have their, they have their budget locked down. They have their, um, you know, dates, uh, which I'm sorry to say will remain over the U.S. Thanksgiving. Uh, they have their venue. They have their government representatives who are chairing, who will be here, so you can ask them about <laughs> that. But also you'll be, uh, of course, have, they'll be here to answer questions on uh, um, their priorities for, for internet policy discussions for the year forward. Um, and they are also looking to hear from, from business of what we are looking from the IGF, what we are looking to get in 2019. Um, so they, they were the only delegations who asked questions back, so be prepared to, um, to share your ideas and thoughts with them. And one meeting that we have um, still to be confirmed, um, and I will get back to you as soon as I hear back, is the government of France. Uh, we're looking to meet them on Wednesday morning. Um, hopefully, we can confirm that as soon as possible. Um, David Martignon is in discussion with the, uh, the, the state, state secretary who is taking on his portfolio. Um, as you all know, um, David Martignon is moving on to Afghanistan to be the ambassador of France. So the um, IG and internet policy discussions will, will remain with the, the secretary of state. Um, and he is looking to, to get that participation for us. Um, uh, as soon as that is confirmed, I'll let you, I'll let you know. And of course, uh, be sure um, to, to you know, keep an eye out for our IGF newsletter. Uh, we're sending that out every day with a couple of highlights from the day past and, and sharing the highlights um, of sessions that are coming up. Um, so please feel free to uh, you know, look for that and, and participate in the sessions. And if there's anything, any other sessions that you would like to highlight um, or raise attention to, um, please, please let, let us know and we'll highlight that for members. Two um, open forums that I would like to uh, highlight for you if you haven't seen it yet. Um, the, German, um, uh, the German government is looking for a dialogue on internet governance. Um, that is going on today or tomorrow, I'm not sure. 
me just check here. Um, that's going on tomorrow from 3 to 4. Um, uh, that's about strengthening the IGF. Uh, and there is also an open forum uh, by Japan on the G20. Um, that's going on, on on 14th of November on Wednesday. I know. What, one moment. What, one, I'm, I'm finishing in, in one minute. Thank you for your understanding. Uh, and also uh, an open forum by the Chinese government also on November uh, 14th from 11 to 12 on technological innovations on internet governance issues. So keep an eye out for that. And if you can attend, please do so. Thank you so much. And thank you for your patience. Uh, the meeting is wrapped up.
Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Bonjour and good French. This is the workshop number 407 about digital development and data protection in the global south. MENA region as an example that I have the pleasure to moderate today together with Madame Zina Bouhard, the, the online mod moderator and also with the rapporteur. Welcome to all of you and I hope that this session will be of great benefit for you. One of the most important goals of the World Summit on Information Society, the WSIS, was to narrow the digital divide that may also contribute in narrowing the social divide between the global so south and the global north. 15 years later, where we are, was the divide reduced? Did the internet contribute in reducing the gap between the M4 poor and M4 rich? How about the development in the global south? What are the digital elements that may help a better economic growth? Did the internet contribute in the achievement of the SDGs? Also, what about the other concerns added today to the ones of 2003, such as privacy and data protection? To answer all these questions, eminent experts have been invited to present their views and their experiences thereupon with a special focus on the MENA region. I will start with Mr. Aziz Hilali, who is a professor at Rabah University. He is president of the Mediterranean Federation of Internet Associations, and he is also member of the ICANN NOMCOM. Aziz, you have the floor. No, Aziz will, will address the digital divide status 15 years after the conclusion of the World Summit on Information Society and highlight the impact of internet on the development. Aziz, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Hussaini. Uh, uh, my presentation is, uh, as uh, Tigali said, is based on uh, statistics to show the gap between uh, individual households, geographical uh, uh, area at different socioeconomic level in terms of both the opportunities to access ICT and the inequality of use. The latest data on ICT development published by ITU report, which has been pub published annually since 2009, can be summarized as uh, follows. We have continued progress in connectivity and use of ICTs, supported growth in, the, in, in uh, the availability of communications in the past decade, led by growth mobile cellular telephony and more recently in mobile broadband. We have also rapid uh, growth in mobile broadband services, mm -hmm. substantial digital divide between countries and the region and between developed and developing countries. These divides are evident in internet use as well as connectivity. Statistics show more than half of, of all households worldwide now have access to the internet. There is also a significant gender digital divide. It is relatively small in developed countries, more pronounced in uh, in developing countries and substantial in uh, less developed countries, LDCs, where only one in women, in seven women, <laughs> is using the internet compared with one in five men. The gender digital divide in, uh, uh, in Africa appears to have grow, grown significantly over the past five years. Young people also are more likely to be online than their parents. Statistics show that the proportion of online uh, aged 15 to 25, 24 is estimated at more than 70% worldwide. 
here you have four charts. And according to WorldStat, the number of internet users has exceeded 4.4 billion in 2018. That is to say 55% of the world population compared to just 1 billion in 2005. This shows that a continuity of CD upward trend during the period. Chart two and three show that there is there are considerable differences in the experience of countries in different development categories and in uh, different regions. The two graphs respectively show the evolution of the number of individual users in countries with the different development status and by different region between 2005 and 2017. This shows a substantial digi digital divide between developed countries in which 81 of individuals are now uh, estimated to use internet, only 41 for developed countries and 17.5 for LDCs. Chart four shows that the digital divide between developed and developing countries and between regions which are also evident in households internet access levels. The MENA region, which is part of Asia and the Pacific region, both record that under half of, of households having internet access, Africa, however, is lower, is much lower at 18% despite continued CD uh, since 2010. And as Tijani asked me to to conclude with the, the impacts of internet of economic development, it is not easy to evaluate, evaluate with figures the impacts of the internet on development. There are, however, examples that show the positive impacts of the internet that has led developing countries to take advantage of access to global sources of information to improve their economic. This includes the impacts of an education, internet use in education has expanded the horizons of uh, technology with e-learning and also the variability of educational materials. There have also the impacts of in the medicine, internet allows the assistance to help personnel working in the field, access to medical skills, remote medical intervention, an example in Kenya, Thanks to uh, the platform which name is uh, Heal, HealthNet, several cases of patients were, sa were, were saved. Three, the impact of banking and finance. Remote access to banks has facilitated the transfer of money abroad. The, the best known example is the, uh, in, uh, in payment is the M-Pesa in Kenya. This system was developed by telephone operator that allowed 30 million, one minute, one minute, 30 million users to send cash to other mobile phone users. And um, impacts of business, the cost, the cost is the redu reduction is one of the main, <coughs> pardon, in the, the main impact direct connection between buyers and sellers. Direct association also between sellers and consumers. And then that's it. Thank you. Today. Thank you, Aziz. Thank you. You uh, presented only successful cases, but we will see if Rima will uh, give us uh, other uh, other kind of uh, of results. The second speaker is Rima Hlais, who is assistant professor at the Lebanese University Faculty of Engineering, and uh, she is also head of the scientific committee at the Lebanese Order of Engineers and Architects for three years. She will uh, present the impact of ICTs and internet in particular on the achievements of the SDGs and on the daily life of grassroots population in the global south. Rima, you have the floor. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here. It's a great pleasure for me to be part of this very interesting session where I will present the impact of ICT and internet in achieving the SDG goals, and I really hope you will enjoy the session. Please first allow me 
very briefly to thank the organizer of the big job they have done, uh, the Order of Engineer of Architects at Lebanon for their support, and special thanks go to Emmanuel and Tijani for their constant support. 20 years ago, we'd, uh, we never could have imagined how smart our mobile phones will become, how integral they will be to our daily life, and to which extent they will impact our manners and behaviors. Modern information and communication technologies have created a global village in which every single individual of the global community is able to communicate with another individual no matter how distant they are from each other as if they lived in the same neighborhood. The big fact is that information and communication technology and internet are extremely affecting our societies and accelerating human progress. Based on this fact, I will show you during my presentation that ICT and internet are critical enablers of sustainable development and can play a very crucial role to achieve the 17 sustainable development goals set by the UNDP by 2030. Uh, due to the, to the limited time allocated to my speech, I will only be addressing a few of them, but will be ready to, to discuss the remaining goals during the next open discussion. Let me start with the sustainable development goal number four, the quality of education. By 2030, all boys and girls should be attending a free primary and secondary school. Students deserve to get their education from highly professional teachers who are following regular professional training. ICT is an empowering revolution in digital learning. Mobile devices connected to internet allow now students as well as teachers to access easily assessed via YouTube explainer videos and massive open online courses, for example. Uh, we know we, as the statistics shown, we have 37 percentage of children still out of school by 2016, uh, which is uh, unacceptable. Poverty and bad political situations are among several reasons behind this number, as the case in Syria, Yemen, and Iraq, for example. The situation of the refugees in most countries, also of the MENA region, is very hard. Their children, adolescents, and youth are suffering from lack of educational personnel, especially in rural areas. In such cases, internet can help bridge the gap given that the prices of computers or smartphones are decreasing and the internet platform being less expensive than building schools or universities. Empowering our internet accessibility and quality is a must. Connecting students together for collaboration, problem solving, global awareness is very important because the quality education is not only about performance, but it is on, it's also about the capacity of students to understand their world and to respect other people and cultures. About the gender equality, which is the sustainable development goal number five, how ICT and internet can help to empower women and promote gender equality. Due to ICT and internet, everyone has access to, online, to the same online resources and opportunities. From statistics, the internet penetration in the MENA region has been 81.4% by December uh, 2017. Via easy access to internet, knowledge is equally addressed to everyone. Women especially will be able to share experiences and similar of similarities in the developed countries, raising awareness about women rights. Now due to ICT, women will have direct access to employment opportunities as owners, managers, or employees of new business ventures. Women will also, due to internet access, have stronger voice in their communities. By empowering women through knowledge, opportunities, and choices, we are empowering the whole community to develop and to be productive. Based on my experience in the field of education in universities in my country, Lebanon, I can say that females are nowadays strongly present in almost all the fields, particularly engineering, which is my specialty, in all branches like civil, telecom, electronic, mechanical, biomedical, and chemical engineering. I, a brief statistic I have done uh, at the order of engineer and architects, I can report a 41% increase in the number of female engineers between the years 2012 and 2017. On the other side, women in the least developed countries are struggling to prove their ability in handling big responsibilities, and thanks to UNDP always present to support us in this long journey. Uh, now about the Sustainable development goal number 9, 11, and 12. More than 70% stated by the World Bank of the population in the MENA region are living in urban areas. Cities should be designed with safe and affordable housing. As we need to improve citizen daily life, sustainability requires investment in infrastructure like transport roads, electricity, and irrigation, and of course, internet and ICT. 
Uber is an example of service provider via internet of for well-being and social impact in poor public transport cities and lack of employment. It helps people generate income by driving and help commuters tackle lack of public transport. Digital infrastructure is essential to empower innovation, industry, and economy. A lot of effort should be done to enhance the speed and the quality of the internet in the MENA region. As in 2020, it is expected that only 16% of the mobile internet users in the MENA region will use a 4G connection. Smart grids, smart metering are all innovative technologies that help reducing the consumption. For example, sensors will allow to increase or decrease temperature when needed, dim lights when nobody is around, and send an alert when water leaks happen, for example. Now, ICT themselves require ener energy consumption. Research is promoted to minimize the negative impact of ICT. One of these new technologies is harvesting. Energy harvesting is the deri deriving energy <coughs> from external sources as solar, thermal, wind, or kinetic energy. This energy, when captured, stored, is able to be used for small wireless autonomous devices like those used in wearable electronics and wireless sensor networks. Now about the good health and well-being, affordable and clean energy and climate action. Quantified health, as you know, is the future of healthcare. ICT provides each member of the society an electronic me medical card where all of the health information are indexed Data inside are then easily accessible to improve patient's health in case of any accident. Moreover, wearable devices can provide information about any patient, which can be remotely analyzed to bring out the convenient outcome regarding the treatment to be followed by the patient. Smart grids allow all also buildings to benefit from green energy like solar energy or wind, or wind energy to procure electricity in a smart collaborative way with the classical network. Smart buildings can, as described in the previous slide, can enhance a clean energy also. Concerning the climate, one minute. Concerning the climate action, an urgent col collective work is a must. ICTs can play a crucial role in earth monitoring, sharing climate and weather information via applications where you can find on our smartphones. Where the most important point in is bringing early warning systems, which in case of disasters can help saving uh, lives of people. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you, Rima, and sorry to cut you. Thank you very much, and uh, I understood from your speech that uh, the, um, uh, the goal of the WSIS wasn't, wasn't achieved. But we, have, we, are, we are hoping no, that the SDGs, we will uh, try to, to reach the, the, the goals of the SDGs. Thank you very much. So now we will go to the uh, next speaker, who is Mr. Charles Chaben who is the executive director at, uh, of Abu Ghazala Intellectual Property and the chair of uh, Talal Abu Ghazala Group ICT Committee. He is also the chair of the Arab MAD, the Arab IGF MAD. Charles will provide his experience in the workplace per performance, also in the strategy execution and as well as improving legislation that stimulates investment and leadership. Besides, he will explain how the digital economy provides better opportunities mm -hmm. to everyone, including small businesses. Charles, you have the floor. Thank you very much and good morning, everyone. A little bit change to the business side, a little bit, uh, especially for our new business uh, leaders, hopefully, and the small businesses in the world, and how this will help. Uh, I will go exactly, uh, sorry, I don't have slides, but I will uh, just try to make it in a small, brief uh, information. Uh, as uh, Mr. Tijani explained that um, any business should think of ICT as a new enabler. And the best way we saw it is that you need to have a strategy, not to wait until something happens. And when I talk about this, I mean, um, for example, artificial intelligence. Everybody now is talking about it. So. Will it help your business or not? You need to study it first. If it does help you, you should start, each business, even small businesses, should start preparing what they want to do. Um, I made it as an example, this artificial intelligence, because some people say, I want to be artificial intelligence, or, or sorry, I mean, I use artificial intelligence systems. But you need to define what you need from this new technology. So this is the most important issue and what it will solve for you in specific. Usually it has uh, 
you should have its clear target. For example, let me give you an example in our firm. So we are working on preparing something that even will do re the research instead of the paralegals and lawyers. So this is something very new, but at least it had will help me reduce a lot of time in the research. Then the person or the, uh, the individual, the lawyer, the expert, whoever wants, he will, he will have to be more innovative because he cannot compete with the machine, by the way, in, in this field. So this is uh, this a small uh, issue. Uh, going to the legalization part, I think this, um, our country should, should have clear legalization to, in, let's, um, to support the businesses. One, uh, in some of our countries, since we are talking about the MENA region as an example, I'm sorry to say that some of the countries change a lot. So a business will open, then suddenly he will discover that uh, there was change in the way the taxation, for example. So this is a, an important issue and we witness it in some of the countries. And we witness some small businesses leaving countries because of this issue, which is they say we cannot know what next year they, there will be a change. So uh, th th this is what I wanted to mention in specific about legalization, just to try to hopefully our uh, government will be able to put something clear to make the business sector uh, confident that this will not change, let's say, next year. Going to the individuals. The, I think my colleagues already covered what, what was covered from the SDGs and how the new uh, technology is, is helping everyone. So from, a, from my experience, to be honest, this is a wonderful chance for all individuals to do something special. What I mean by that, person sitting in Jordan or in a small country has the same chance like anyone in, the, in Europe or the US or Japan. When I mean the same chance, he only needs a connection to the internet and he's an innovative person, I'm sure he can develop so deliver something and, and we have some very good experiences in the region as you know. There are some businesses already started with very small online business that doesn't need a lot of investment and it ended up being a very good uh, known so, uh, business. Uh, the, I know we have specific time, I will leave the rest maybe interactively at the end of the, of the questions, but since I'm covering for my colleague Nidal, who is the CEO of Intaj, the Internet uh, Information Technology Association of Jordan, I wanted to give you some numbers he says that he gave to me, just to know when you invest in this work, in this new technologies, what will happen. Jordan now, for example, has around 75% of the Arabic content on the internet. So this is, I think, a good number for Jordan. When you, when every, I think you know that now the Arabic uh, contents, much better than a few years ago, still less than 3% of the contents on the internet, but at least it's becoming better and you can find more contents for the Arabic language. And I'm happy to know that 75% of it is coming from Jordan. Um, the revenue of the ICT firms in Jordan reached more than two billion last year, uh, mainly in the software industry. So many of the software, uh, we have a lot of software from Jordan, this is an example, and they export mainly to the United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, United Kingdom, and United States of America. Th these are their top markets. I'm putting the numbers as I told you, my, colli uh, my colleague Nidal sent to me, so you know that this, is, this has a future, and Jordan is an example of it. Uh, IT export revenue by, um, again, I mentioned that, yeah, I'm finished, yeah. The last number is the total ICT employment. Uh, more than 7,500 people were employed last year only in the ICT sector, and 1.2 non-Jordanians only, the rest are Jordanians. So this is a big enabler to even to to hire more people, thank you. Thank you, Charles, for this presentation and for uh, telling us how uh, the digital economy gives opportunities for young people in our region. <coughs> the next speaker is Madame Wafa Ben Hassim, who is the policy leader for MENA region for Access Now, which is a global not-for-profit uh, uh, organization that defends human rights in the digital age. Wafa will provide a perspective on the policies or lack of them 
related to privacy and data protection, with special focus on the recent introduction of the data protection laws in North Africa. She will specifically speak about the application or in Tunisia of the existing data protection law since 2004. Wafa, you have the floor. Thank you, Tijani, and thank you, everybody, for being here. Uh, welcome to the IGF. It's a little bit tough to animate a 9 a.m. session on the first day, but we're trying our best. Uh, so uh, as Tijani mentioned, um, the digital development in the Middle East and North African region is growing very quickly. Um, but not only that, because my, I think my presentation shifts a little bit to more policy-related uh, issues, and we're seeing slowly the sophistication of the digital policy landscape. Um, where digital policy literacy amongst civil society organizations, amongst individuals, and especially amongst governments um, has gone up, thankfully. Um, one thing I did want to say at, at the onset is that the Middle East and North Africa region is very diverse, and uh, not every country or not even, not every region within the region is the same. So generally the way that um, is a better way to conceive of the region is probably like a Maghreb, Levant, and Gulf, because a lot of these regions have uh, specific particularities that really define how the population and, and how people use the internet, how they use ICTs, how they interact with technology, and um, as a result, what are the needs from that interaction. Um, to, to go to the topic of data protection, this is a relatively, I would say, new concept in, in the region as a whole. Uh, the concept of privacy has existed for centuries. Um, it's existed with uh, Arab culture, it's existed with Islamic culture, it's always there. But to actually have that uh, culture of privacy be translated to data protection is something else. Uh, privacy of an individual's uh, information or what they say and what they don't say, it takes a little bit of uh, effort to translate that into data protection. Uh, because that is the modern understanding of what privacy really means, and also data protection is usually reflected in legislation and regulation that actually and effectively protect one's information, especially personal information. Um, and the concept of data protection as a result is relatively new, especially for policymakers. Um, the, some countries have started to take on data protection in uh, their national legislation. And I will uh, go ahead and use the Tunisian example just because it is the most recent example that we have of legislators trying to implement data protection laws. Um, and then after that, I should conclude my presentation so it won't take long. Um, in Tunisia, we saw, so there has been uh, uh, an organic law on privacy and data protection in 2004. Uh, but as I mentioned earlier, it's old laws like that that reflect an idea of privacy, but not necessarily data protection. It doesn't have the nitty gritty details of what it means to protect an individual and how does that right to privacy interact with other rights, et cetera. So this is where legislation like the one that was introduced this summer, uh, or a little bit earlier than the summer uh, in Tunisia comes in. And uh, other global pieces of regulation such as the GDPR, the global uh, data protection uh, sorry, the General Data Protection Regulation in the EU uh, has led, has influenced countries in the Middle East and North Africa to implement these kinds of laws as well, especially because they they interact with, these countries interact very strongly economically with the EU. Uh, so the data protection draft law in Tunisia, uh, really, I think the, the biggest thing it achieved so far is that it opened up a conversation uh, with multiple stakeholders, with civil society, with the government, with independent authorities to, um, to discuss and negotiate and really kind of hone in on the finer points of the law. So it still hasn't passed. And uh, it has not passed because there was an interesting interaction between certain articles, uh, in certain, certain articles between the right to access public information and the right to the protection of personal data. And so um, there was a little bit of a, uh, Friction, I should say, uh, but it's a very positive friction. I think it's a very positive development because we see that civil society is interacting with these concepts. They're trying to define what it really means to have personal data be protected. Um, and what does it also mean to have the right to access public information, which is something that civil society fought very, very hard for in that country in order to have, especially following uh, a, a, a regime that didn't allow for the, for the dissemination of public information and public documents. 
So, um, so we're now still having this conversation, the balance between these two, and there are obviously several models to follow in the world. There's uh, the UK model, there are di different country member states of the EU models, there's the Australian model, there's, um, and every country kind of finds this uh, balance in its own way. So uh, we're still kind of figuring that out ourselves. But um, and just one last thing I wanted to mention, data protection should not be seen as something that hinders the growth or creation of businesses. It should be seen as something that encourages it and, and, and makes business flourish. And the reason I say this is because um, as a company, when you protect a user's information uh, and you're uh, compliant with various regulation around the world, you're a you actually have a, a strategic advantage over other businesses that do not, especially in countries outside the EU. So um, in the MENA region, we should really start to see this as an opportunity. And I say this all the time to startups I mentor or younger businesses I work with, that this is your chance to really have a bigger opportunity to, to grow your market and to, and to be more successful as well. So um, we'll le that's the end of my uh, presentation, but I'll be happy to answer questions and continue the conversation later as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wafa. And, um, yeah. I have to confess that in Tunisia, I was surprised to see those uh, um, uh, those civil society people uh, uh, be against the the data protection law. They say that this is to to prevent us to access data, and this is right. They they they, they are not wrong. The problem is where to put the bar. This is the problem. And I think that uh, now with the discussion, we are better now. We have a better understanding and we will reach very soon the right agreement. Thank you very much, Wafa. Uh, I would like to, for the record, I would like to, uh, to express my disappointment that the remote participation is not available in this room. <laughs> no, it is not available. This is a big problem because remote participation is one of the main factor of the success of IGF. And today, we don't have it. This is really disappointing. Okay, now, last but not the least, our last speaker is Mr. Isa Hasna, who is I ICT policy specialist and president of the Jordan Open Source Association which is a Jordan non-profit organization that promotes open technologies and human rights online. Isa will uh, provide us his perspectives on the protection of digital rights, privacy and data protection policies or lack of them in Jordan with special focus on biometric data processing <coughs> and their protection. Isa, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Tijani. Thank you, everyone. Um, I might follow up with the good presentation of uh, my colleague Wafa regarding data protection um, by providing some legal findings in the, the MENA region regarding privacy and how basically they are connected with uh, topics like biometric data. Um, so basically, most of uh, Arab countries lack any legal framework to protect uh, personal data. There are some exceptions. The Tunisian one probably is the most famous one. They have data protection since 2004. Uh, all the countries that basically currently have data protection laws are uh, Morocco since 2009, Qatar since 2016, although it's not uh, implemented yet. And um, there are almost, we can say, two newcomer, newcomers probably uh, as a result of the post-GDPR uh, uh, era um, Algeria and Bahrain adopted two uh, data protection laws in 2018. Um, we, should we should mention here that basically there are different countries that are uh, currently drafting uh, data protection laws. Uh, Jordan is one of them, uh, Egypt, uh, the UAE, um, and other uh, Gulf countries as well. Um, at the same time, I want to mention um, basically two considerations regarding data protection laws. The first one is that not all privacy laws are created equally. Um, some privacy laws in, in the Arab world or, or in other countries might also have some kind of negative implications on, the, uh, on human rights. 
Um, I really encourage you to have a look at the recently published Freedom on the Net report that has a, a complete section about comparison of different uh, data protection laws and some negative implications that uh, they, um, they might have. Um, for example, the Moroccan uh, uh, data protection law has some kind of restriction on the use of encryption tools, um, which is considered somehow to be uh, one of the human rights um, in, the, in the digital era. Um, the second consideration is, is also uh, regarding that, um, basically that some kind of data protection is already there in some countries, but not really in the data protection uh, law, in a, in a, let's say in a harmonized legal framework that take into consideration the uh, rights of the data holder and establish, for example, a data protection uh, authority. Um, also regarding um, personal uh, data, um, actually newer laws tend to differentiate between uh, categories of data and all of them or most of them create a specific special category for sensitive data. Um, this is actually, we can see that in, in different um, mean origin laws, um, Morocco, Qatar, Algeria, and Bahrain uh, all have some kind of special protection for sensitive data. Um, and regarding biometric data, some of them, uh, some of these laws explicitly mention biometric data, and, uh, and some of them actually put them within the sensitive data uh, categorization. Uh, we have two cases in the, in the MENA region. Um, this is Morocco and Algeria. Uh, both have very explicit definition of biometric or genetic data, and uh, they put some kind of restrictions on how this data is uh, are processed or uh, are collected. Um, um, so, uh, this was more related to the legal part of the uh, of the data protection and biometric data. Uh, it will be also very um, interesting to see some kind of uh, recent developments in, in, in terms of how biometric data are being used and utilized in the Arab world. Um, we can see that different countries are adopting biometric ID cards. Um, one of the uh, oldest examples in the MENA region is probably UAE. They have a, um, a biometric ID card program since 2014. And uh, more and more countries are adopting this, uh, these ID cards. Um, for example, Morocco is expected to, to have a biometric ID uh, system in 2019. Um, even countries are, all the countries are using biometric data for SIM card registration. Um, for example, this is happening in the UAE. Uh, there are now um, recent developments in Jordan to, uh, to basically, if, if any citizen uh, would to basically register a SIM card, a uh, uh, telephone, or uh, line, should provide some kind of biometric data. And we can also see that biometric security has been adopted uh, more and more. Um, for example, I mean, face recognition or iris scanning in, uh, in airports around the MENA region. Um, and regarding to this recent developments, probably we can also ask ourselves some different questions to basically to see how they are affecting the human rights in the, in the digital uh, era. Uh, for example, since, since we are talking about countries, most of them have no legal protection, have no legal framework to, to protect this personal data. So some of the questions would be who's storing the data, how it basically could be transferred uh, into other entities. Um, are this biometric data that are used for uh, ID systems utilized by other services? We, we're talking about public services or other platforms that could basically uh, allow uh, their utilization from private entities. Um, also, what are the rights of the citizen? Are they able to opt out from these biometric ID uh, card systems? Um, do they have access to their own data? Um, and what is the accuracy or uh, full percentage of, of such systems in terms of, um, of, terms of security or um, accuracy in general? Um, I will also um, mention one use case uh, before um, ending my talk. Um, it's, it's more about using biometric data in terms of facial recognition and iris scanning. Uh, there is um, a big 
project happening in Jordan, in Syrian uh, refugee camps, actually, um, that specifically um, it's, it's using biometric to bring assistance to refugees. Um, this is a big UNHCR project, so basically refugees uh, are providing their biometrical data in order to uh, get uh, their food uh, rations. Um, some, pros, some pros will be to basically there are no lost cards anymore, faster queues, but we could also have a look at the, let's say, negative implications of that. Uh, so hackers might be able to access this data. Um, this databases could be used for uh, other purposes. At the end, I would just um, bring some uh, next steps, I would say, or recommendation regarding that. Um, uh, privacy laws should be uh, a priority for, for different uh, legislative and uh, policy makers. Um, privacy assessment for high risk data should be there regarding sensitive and biometric data and probably the civil society and other entities should raise awareness about privacy issues. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aysa. Um, you know that uh, data protection today is one of the hot topics discussed everywhere. Because, as you know, there was a big implication of the use of our data without our uh, uh, consultant. So uh, it was, um, uh, now the European uh, countries have decided to, uh, to have a, a regulation about that, which is the GDPR. And um, everyone who is uh, dealing with European people have to comply with this uh, regulation. Data protection is about data collection, data process, processing, data transfer, data retention, and data access. So th there is a, a real problem now because we have two main values, the privacy and data protection and the transparency. And this is why there is always and everywhere there is a confrontation between those two values. And there are people who are defending the transparency and they have their rationale and people who are defending the, the privacy and data protection and they have also their rationals. If you know uh, at ICANN we have today a, a real um, debate, very hot debate about that because the registrant data are collected by registrars and uh, they are processed, they are used, etc. And with the GDPR, we have to comply with the GDPR. So there is a problem. There is two kind of people. Those who are uh, defending the privacy and the data protection who, who says we don't have to collect as much data, we don't need them, we don't have, we, we don't have to, to distribute it to, uh, to other parties, only registrars have, have to have them. Uh, we don't, uh, the retention of data when the, 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 the website, the, no, the, the, the domain name uh, is expired, we don't have to, to, uh, to keep the data, we have to erase it, etc. So we have to comply with GDPR. Other people said, hey, and how we will uh, prevent the cyber crimes? How we will prevent phishing? If today we don't have as much spams as before, it is because we are using these data to, uh, to eliminate and to, to stop any kind of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of use of the domain name for spams, etc. So two things and two variable uh, 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 rationals. And um, it, is not, it is not solved yet. I hope it will be solved because uh, I hope that people will have the spirit of the balance and uh, the, the because all this is the interest of the user. We, the interest of the registrant is that uh, its data is not uh, shared with everyone and the interest of the end user is not to have spam, not to have cyber crimes, etc. So I think that uh, in these few years we will have more debate about that and I hope that we will reach the right consensus. Thank you very much, and now I open the floor to you. Please. Thank you for the, the useful uh, description. Can you give your name, please?
Actually, I mean, a good, a good case will be uh, Algeria. Um, the Algerian law regarding data protection is, is very, um, very, very good in terms of uh, rights and how they are dealing with personal data. Uh, it's, it's a very GDPR compliant, I could say, and there is a business or economic uh, reason behind that. A uh, lot of, of um, um, companies in Algeria are providing services to Europe, especially France. Um, what, what probably um, the, the uh, how the, it's called the call, uh, the call centers, for example. Um, lots of Fra French companies are uh, basically having call centers in Algeria, and they are dealing with personal data of European citizens, and French citizens. So what Algeria did is that they really implemented a, a legal framework that is uh, very compliant with GDPR. Can I, can I quickly add something to that, Tijani? Yes. Please. Just quickly to follow up on the, very fast. I, I, to answer your question as well about adequacy, adequacy decisions, I don't know of any country right now in the region that's actually actively applying for that, but I do think is that it's important that these countries pass laws that, first of all, protect their own citizens and their own residents' data, and then to make sure that it's compliant with the GDPR. Thank you for the floor. My name is Jörg Beglinger from uh, Switzerland, uh, from the private sector. And uh, my question is, for all these new legislation in, uh, in Africa, what does actually the, 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 um, the master project before? Is it the GDPR? Is it something uh, genuine? Is it uh, the Council of Europe 108 new revision um, uh, uh, convention? So what is actually at the basis of it, and how do we make sure that it's some kind of a, of a general assumption what exactly companies, for example, need to do? Because general, uh, companies have really a challenge, what should be the baseline for them? And currently it's a GDPR, but uh, not in uh, every area of the world. Wafa? Yeah, so um, I think this dis distinction between Convention 108 and the GDPR needs to be made, and I'm definitely not the, the EU expert here, but Convention 108 has been ratified by a few countries in the region, notably Tunisia, and I believe Morocco is in the process of trying to ratify it, but I could be wrong on that. Uh, but several other countries have signed on to it. But signing the Convention 108, even ratifying it, really mean, doesn't mean very much in terms of data protection on the ground of users' data. So this is why the passage of data protection legislation is important to uh, reflect the commitment that the country made to Convention 108. Um, at the basis of these new laws, hopefully, would be the protection of, of uh, user data, as I mentioned in my previous answer. But um, at, the heart of, at the heart of these movements, um, of these policy movements is a certain special economic interaction with the EU, especially for North African countries, where a lot of, for example, call centers exist in, in North African countries where they're treating the data of European <laughs> residents. So, um, so yeah, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, and for the record, uh, in Tunisia, the first law on data protection was done on 2004, much before the GDPR. Muna. Hello everybody, I'm uh, Mona al ashar Jabour. I'm a professor of law. I work as an expert uh, for the League of Arab States. I've prepared the Convention of Cybersecurity and the most important thing, I've prepared the study for the Arab region on personal data protection. And uh, what I uh, will say here is that technology is, won't be the one who rules the net. So I think we have uh, to understand what are the legal concepts. And if it's uh, true that everyone, technical uh, policy makers, decision maker, whoever, has to contribute, it's true also that uh, legal people have to be here. Our experience with our legislation, the new Lebanese legislation, 
says that when technical people want to write legislation, they will fail to do it alone. And that's what made our legislation wait for 14 years to be approved. And uh, the last version of it shows very, very clearly that it wasn't well done because also according to our experience, those who have contributed wasn't really the one who should be there. And the last uh, meeting we did at the parliament, at the Lebanese parliament, two weeks ago, where we called for these uh, NGOs to come and uh, say what you, they think of the new legislation, showed us people, technical people, who wanted to, for example, go for civil courts for uh, um, crimes. You see? So they were like uh, saying, well, we don't, we don't want to go before penal codes, uh, we want civil uh, courts which is, uh, excuse me, um, a pure uh, un-understanding of the nature of law, of the procedures, and this is a problem, you see? So what we need is, before everything, we need to understand that when we talk about personal data protection, it's true that it is about economic interest and protecting economic interest. But at the end of the day, these interests of Whoever states should be, de should be protected and defended by law. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mula. Of course, uh, if we speak about regulation, we need to, um, uh, to uh, involve uh, the legal persons and lawyers, uh, for sure. Uh, we, we will not write regulations by uh, uh, everyone. Any other question or discussion? Yes, please. Go ahead, Abdelaziz. Okay, bonsoir à tout le monde. Euh, je réponds au nom d'Abdéjelil Bacharbon, euh, je viens du chat. Donc ma question, c'est avant tout, je vous remercie, le panéliste et le modérateur. Donc ma question, quel est le bon élève au niveau de, de la région du MENA et concernant la protection des données personnelles liées avec le développement numérique que on pourrait euh, probablement s'inspirer et appliquer dans nos différents pays et Je vous remercie. <rire> The question is for you. <laughs> I, I, I used to study school at uh, French at school, ever, but I ever, okay, <laughs> I will translate it. I, I will translate it. He asked about the good people, about uh, data protection in, in the region. Means that what is the the, the best country? Oh, I mean, if you, if you want, uh, it's, it's really a very hard and difficult uh, question to answer. Um, I mean, for it truly really depends what is the standard that we are looking for. I mean, if, if it's GDPR, uh, I might say the Algeria law is somehow, uh, and since it's also, I mean, somehow new, and it reflects lots of the concepts of the GDPR. Um, but I'm, I'm not sure, for example, I mean, I was thinking about the how legal and technical people could uh, come together. Um, in, in Jordan, for example, we have uh, um, a draft law. Now it's, it's basically the third version of it. And there was a round table since um, um, for five years, for example, that basically were regrouping uh, legal, technical people and trying to put efforts together in order to, to have very good results in terms of, of a data protection law. So probably the methodology could be better there. Um, I'm, I'm not really sure how basically the, uh, the, the law in Algeria was basically produced, let's say. Um, so, so it really depends on which aspects you are looking for. Um, I think they even, I mean, the Tunisian one um, is probably, is, it was first approved in 2004, so even the general mindset about privacy, even at the global level, was somehow different. Um, things in the new draft law probably could, uh, uh, could be somehow more um, compliant, more inclusive of all the possible rights that the data holder could have. Wafa, do you have something to add? Uh, not really, but I did want to say, as a lawyer, I completely agree with uh, Muna, and I also think that 
uh, whatever data protection laws do pass, especially when it does it comes to balancing between ac right to access public information uh, for the citizens, not just for the governments, and the right to privacy, what's really important is that the laws are necessary and proportionate, right? So that uh, they follow these principles and that they, even the exceptions that could be noted in the law are not vague and that they're well-defined. So for example, like with national security, like that's certainly a legitimate interest. However, the law needs to specify that in clarity and also have a good uh, remedy uh, for, uh, for cases that don't go right. So, um, but yeah, the Algerian law in particular, I mean, I've done a very light analysis of it before, and uh, unfortunately, they didn't really involve a lot of stakeholders in the drafting of that. That's one thing I had a lot of concern with. It just kind of popped up out of nowhere in Parliament, um, and it is a decent, uh, a decent piece of legislation, uh, but I think uh, we could do better in terms of uh, having stakeholders, and I don't just mean civil society. I also mean academia, lawyers, uh, the technical community, et cetera, so. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, Charles. Just a small addition, uh, not related directly to the subject, but uh, I know that, as my colleague mentioned, in Jordan now they are reviewing the laws. One of the important issues about it is that they have harsh now penalties. Mm -hmm. So I think this is needed. Some of our countries, Jordan as an example, was the penalties was very, to be honest, I don't mind to do something wrong because th there were no penalties. Some, sorry to say that, but it seems you have to enforce it. So they are doing it more. And the other addition I want to say that I read recently in Egypt, they are doing something similar to the GDPR. I'm not sure what is it exactly, but they said they, they are ha having their own uh, law. They are studying it and they will want to enforce it soon. Thank you, Sharon. Muna. Just, I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm going in the same uh, thinking. Uh, what I want to say is that um, actually when I studied these uh, Arab legislations, I found that um, they have this, some common flaws which relates to the authority in charge of protection. And uh, as for the general concept, I think that somewhere it could help, this is my only opinion, when it is about technology. Because it allows um, the judge or whoever authority is there to uh, extend the protection a little bit. It's very bad, we know, as legal personnel that, um, excuse me, professional, that general concepts are very dangerous for liberties. Uh, and uh, we have to be specific to um, defend the citizens against the government. But when it is about protecting citizens, I am for the general concepts. Thank you, Muna. Any other question? Yes, please. Oh, hi, my name is Odelio. I'm a law student from Brazil and I'm working on an NGO called Institute for Research on Internet and Society. I would like to make a broad question about the data protection authorities. How are the discussions going there? And are you having some difficulties to approve like good institutions for enforcement in the region? Thank you. Thank you. Who wants to answer? You want to answer? I talked a lot, so okay. <laughs> I can't really. So if I understand, correctly, you are asking about different DPAs in, in the R board. Um, I mean, they really differ, I mean, and probably because of the concept about, even the legal concepts behind the DPAs, somehow they're, they're somehow different. For example, if we look at the Jordanian example, um, the DPA is totally, is, is somehow a dependent unit, um, dependent to the government. It's, it's a single unit within the Ministry of ICT, uh, which doesn't take into account that there should be some kind of judiciary um, power to, to it. Um, but this is, for example, it's not really the case in other countries like uh, Tunisia. Um, Tunisia have an independent uh, body. Um, this is the case of Morocco as well. Um, the, the how members are selected are basically dif differ from um, a country to, to another but uh, you can have a mix, for example, of people that are being selected from specific ministries. We are talking about the Ministry of Interior, Ministry of Justice, and um, other members of the DPA that are basically selected or appointed within the, um, the, 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 by the parliament. 
um, by different houses of, 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 the, of the parliament. So there is not really a, a specific format that is specifically implemented in all the uh, MENA region. Uh, it really differ from uh, each country to, 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 to the other. But you know, I mean, a generic idea would be to, to, to have a very strong independent authority that has the power to, to basically to, um, to, 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 uh, to put in practice what is really written in the law in terms of uh, rights and in terms of uh, uh, people that have been uh, affected in terms of data protection could basically recite to, to, to these authorities in order to, um, in order to, the, to the law to be implemented at the end. And Thank you, Aysa. Um, yes. Last word, yeah. Actually, I just want to say that um, protection and privacy or um, protection of personal data needs to be done also across um, the culture. Because also according to our own experience in training and capacity building, whatever you want, it, we, we find that people need to understand what it is about. We need to spread the word and we need to work on that. Thank you. Any other question? We still have time. No questions? Uh, yeah, I think uh, education and culture is really important because, uh, and that's part of our work at Access Now as well, is just as a nonprofit, we work a lot with uh, especially vulnerable groups such as children, um, re religious minorities, sexual minorities, uh, people that may need to be more uh, cognizant and vigilant about their digital security. And so kind of um, helping people understand what it means to be secure online. I think it's important to teach that as well. And we're trying to work uh, on the ground with the Data Protection Authority as well to have uh, the head of the DPA work with schools to teach them um, how to do that. And also this, this is another program that um, I think other multilateral institutions are interested in as well. So yeah, definitely uh, something to keep in mind. In mind, in mind. Charles, 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 Charles. Oh. <laughs> it's okay. the word of God. <laughs> <laughs> and using my name. Okay. Well, well, thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, I think uh, I have an advice for uh, the businesses again. I will just end with a small sentence regarding the businesses that they need to take data protection in very imp as a very important issue, not only by teaching all the people working on that, because when you, you, have, when you think big, even as a small business, you need to think that you will, uh, you, your market will be worldwide. So even if you want to deal with Europe, you have to make sure that you comply with the GDPR when you, when, you, uh, when you deal with any other country, you will comply with the laws and that uh, thing. Even for a small issue, and again, this is from experience, even like a mailing list, you cannot send like before unsolicited email. And in fact, yes, as uh, Wafa said, uh, the for business, we didn't find it something wrong because we were even affected by spam and you know all of this. So even this, although some people didn't like it, that they cannot send now, let's say, more news or marketing and material for their clients like before, but I think it's better. So you only send for people who want to receive it, not to make it spam everyone's email about it. So even small thing like this is important. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Charles. And um, uh, I would like to comment on uh, this uh, competition between uh, lawyers and uh, technical people that, uh, that Mona, <laughs> that, that, that Mona just uh, mentioned. It. I don't think that should be something like this because um, when you write a regulation, it cannot be written by other people than lawyers and, uh, uh, and, and law people. But uh, they will write what the technical people will tell them to write. They have the technical, yeah, they make them exact, exact. They have so together. defining the needs is something, writing the regulation is another thing. So I, I don't feel in Tunisia, for example, we have this competition. Frankly speaking, no, okay. No, no, excuse me. I, I wasn't talking about competition. I wasn't. I was talking about ignoring 
the need to talk together and to work together. And as uh, continuing on what uh, uh, Charles uh, said, um, we had this workshop with uh, Bank uh, Banque du Liban and with the Arab uh, Union for Banks. And the problem there was even if we look at our uh, bank um, sector, you know that it is a little bit like Switzerland. So it is very prosperous. It is uh, very aware of all the compliance issues. But when we need to talk with them about the GDPR, there we had problem, convince them that they are concerned. That's why I said we do need culture, not only uh, uh, in teaching uh, in um, schools and universities, who are wherever or vulnerable um, people, we need also to go to business the most aware sectors of the compliance, international compliance issues, need to understand. Thank you, Mona. And for the record, GDPR is not the only regulation about data protection. There are a lot. And uh, uh, for example, in Canada, there is one, and uh, uh, far before the, the GDPR. The problem is that, not the problem, but uh, why the GDPR got this importance, it is because that is fine, very, very big fines yeah, for, for people who don't comply with it. And they have an extra territory uh, 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 impact. So uh, this, this is uh, why the GDPR had this uh, importance. And um, I think that in the future we have to converge toward a regulation that everyone agrees on and that will be more or less uh, the, the global regulation about data protection. I know that there is a big difference between, between uh, countries, between people. Uh, there is a conflict of interest between several, several people and several countries. Uh, and uh, the, I think that we need to go toward the public interest more than the private interest. I mean, the, the interest of everyone, not the interest of only the business people, not only of the registrants, not only of uh, governments, etc. We need to converge toward uh, a global interest and, uh, and have the, a, regula a regulation that will be, I think, uh, uh, not exactly the same, but at least uh, 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 harmonized between all countries. I hope that this will happen. If you don't have other questions, we still have time. Yes, please. I have prepared a study for the Arab of League, uh, for the League of Arab States on the legislation, the actual situation of legislation of personal data protection in the Arab countries. Okay. So I was just curious, is this study published? Is it something that Yes, definitely. It is on um, the site of the Arab uh, of the League of Arab States. It is on the www um, dot cars no no yeah but <laughs> yes dot of course well you let me give you uh, the um, the yeah it is it's, it's public it is public okay. yeah okay if there is no other questions i will uh, first uh, thank all our speakers for uh, their uh, very good uh, presentations and um, I think that uh, they brought different uh, uh, perspectives and different point of view about this issue of data protection and also about the, uh, the, the development uh, and, and used by the, the, uh, the, uh, the new technologies uh, in the MENA region particularly. And um, uh, thank you all. Thank you for the remote moderator, even if we don't have a remote. And uh, I would like to, to repeat it this is something that we have to highlight and to have to go to the organizers here and tell them that there is something very important missing in this meeting. And um, uh, um, uh, thank you all for attending this uh, discussion and I hope it was uh, uh, of benefit for you. Thank you. <laughs>